Welcome out to our Wednesday night Bible study. Thank you, social media, for being with us tonight. We hope that you are blessed just as much as we are in the sanctuary. We know God's going to move and do great things. Let's just lift our hands for a moment to the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus, God. Just thank you, Lord, for another night to come and worship you, God. Help us to just lift you above our day today, Jesus. Lift you above our circumstance or the thing we might be facing, God, decisions, whatever it might be in our lives today. We lift you higher. We exalt your name. Your name is above every name, Lord. Be with us tonight in this place, I pray in your name, God. Hallelujah. God bless you tonight. Oh, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus just Ah! 
And I wouldn't trade you for silver or gold. Oh, I wouldn't trade you for riches untold. You are, for you are, oh yes, you are my everything. Oh, you. healer set me free and I'm happy to be in your truth and I will daily lift my hands for I will always sing of when your love came down and I could sing of your love forever oh I could sing of your And I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hand, for I will always sing of when your love came, came down, and I could sing of your Oh. 
that you went to that cross for us, that you died for our sins, and you rose again because of the love of God in you, Lord. Thank you for your love tonight, we pray in your name. Hallelujah. You can be seated tonight. That was an awesome worship service. Amen. So nice to just split up our week with a service where you can just come and you can just worship and just let the things of your week and your day just fall off in the presence of God. Amen. Well, before we turn it over to Brother Dean, just a quick announcement. Um, if you would like to give tonight, just a reminder, you can drop off your offering in the kiosk boxes in the back of the church. You can mail it in to P.O. Box 4017, Manchester, Connecticut, 06045. You can go to our church website, fgichurch.org, or you can also use the Easy Tithe app and choose FGI Church. Amen. Thank you so much for your giving. It is working. It is blessing. It is prospering the kingdom of God. So thank you so much for that tonight. And we are going to give it right over to Brother Dean. How are you doing? <laughs> well, everybody's getting settled. I have a, I found a song that fits along with the message tonight. So, um, you've owned your fear and all your self-loathing. You've owned the voices inside of your head. You've owned the shame, reproach of your failures. It's time to own your belovedness. You've owned your past and how it's defined you. You've owned everything everybody else says. It's time to hear what your father has spoken. It's time to own your belovedness. He says you're mine. I smiled when I made you. I find you beautiful in every way. My love for you is fierce and unending. I'll come to find you whatever it takes. My beloved. You own the mess you see in the mirror. You've owned the lies that you're just not enough. You've been so blinded by all of your comparing. It's time to own your belovedness. And he says you're mine. I smiled when I made you. I find you beautiful in every way. My love for you is fierce and unending. I'll come to find you whatever it takes. It's time to own your belovedness. God is trying to get through to us what we mean to him. And I think some of the winds that are coming through the church and some of the word of God, God's trying to shake those roots of what we have believed in about ourselves. And he's trying to bring us into a place of knowing that you are his beloved and what God thinks of you. And uh, I think he's trying to shake a lot of those, those other preconceived notions about ourselves, things that have been ingrained in us and, and uh, shake us loose from those because there's a great time coming and it's, it's time to work and pretty soon, 
soon and very soon, the song says, we shall see the king. It's not much longer. And for some of us, it <laughs> might be even shorter. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was looking forward to my retirement. And I said, man, this is never going to happen. But it did. And you know, sometimes I say, God, it seems like it's, it's taking so long. But one day, one day it's going to happen. And then, yeah, we went to a funeral. And I'm thinking to myself, sad to see you go. But you lucky duck. <laughs> Only because we know what's on the other side, don't we? We have a hope. So God is trying to change what we see in our mirrors. God is trying to change the notions we have of ourselves because of past failures. But God doesn't see those. Remember we talked about the Polaroid and how that picture takes time to develop, but God sees the end product? And sometimes spiritually I really wish we could see how God sees us. There is a scripture that says in the Song of Solomon, and I'm going to say something about the Song of Solomon. We have been talking a lot about, about that. And, uh, but Song of Solomon is kind of progressive, but we've been hitting on different things here and there. But it's a great book because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's the story of the love between the bridegroom and the Shulamite, but it's Christ and the church. It's Christ and you. And um, so it's a type. But he said two things. He said, Thou art fair, all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. And that's how God sees us, because he sees us through the blood, and he sees the finished product. And he sees his workings in you. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, about the workings of God in our life. And, um, and sometimes when those things crop up, we think, oh, that's a, that's a bad thing, because God now God is starting to see all these shortcomings and these flaws. But... We're going to learn tonight that it's the opposite. It's the opposite. So why don't we turn in our Bibles to Song of Solomon. And uh, we're going to base our, our text on chapter 4, verse 16. In between Job and Psalms. 4.16. Everybody there? Awake, O north wind, and come, thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. We're going to break that down a little bit. That's a beautiful scripture when you know what he's trying to say there. So um, Sunday mornings have been great. And uh, this last Sunday morning we were seeing people down here and uh, saw the antibodies gathering around. And that was a beautiful thing. I mean, I, I felt like Shelly when she was talking about that Sunday night, how she didn't really do much. She's just kind of watching. <laughs> and uh, I was doing the same thing. I'm watching all the antibodies, all, you know, doing their, doing their job in the body of Christ, really, really, uh, you know, taking charge. And God really moving through the body. And um, it was great. And how many people who came to activity Friday night had a good time? Oh, well, the leaders did. That, that's good. <laughs> we were laughing. It was, it was great. And um, so I encourage you people to come out. It actually was a lot of fun. When we left, I don't think there was one person that wasn't smiling. 
even when they said, can you help us clean? <laughs> Just kidding. And the Sunday night dinner. How many went to the Sunday night dinner? How'd you like it? Yeah. Yep. The food was good. And I was hoping nobody looked when I ate the little dessert. Because <laughs> I opened my mouth up here once and we won't go back there. But the fellowship was great. And uh, old, young, all sitting together. It's great. And uh, yeah, that was a really great night. Just watching the fellowship. But God is manifesting His Spirit throughout the church with the fellowships. And, and if you've been involving yourself in the fellowship at all, you can, you can feel the change. And we've talked about that, but you can feel the change. And um, if you stay away from it, you need to get in it because God is really doing something there. And, uh, but the Spirit of God has also been manifesting what's been being brought in us. And he said he'd confirm the signs with signs following the word of his servants. And you'll see that in healings and all these other things, but you also see it in whatever is preached. If we preach unity, God will move by his spirit to confirm that word. And God is moving in us to prepare us and get us ready. So while that's happening, things are coming to the surface in us. And I don't have to ask you if it's happening. I know it is. <laughs> and, um, but right now we're in his hands, aren't we? God is molding his body. And he's molding his church. And we're in the hands of God right now, getting us ready for a move of God. So sometimes as we draw closer to God and his light, we begin to see some things in ourselves. We're trying to draw close, and we begin to notice little shortcomings in our life coming to the surface. That's not a bad thing. That's God working within you. When God gets ready to do something, if, and you're going to, if you're going to sow in a field, you have to take out the rocks. You have to take out the debris that's gotten there over the, over the winter, things that have come up from the soil. And um, because you're getting ready to sow that new harvest, weeds have to come out. How they get there, I don't know, but they do. But weeds in your life will get there. I don't know how they do, but they do. <laughs> little attitudes, little this, little that, uh, you know, a little slacking off on, on, on our prayer time and just little things here and there. But they have to be weeded. Sometimes we have to reset. But in the winter, before you sow the year before, you take out all the rocks, you do all that stuff, you till the ground, and then you come back the next spring and there's more rocks. And I'm, I'm like, okay. <laughs> but what they do is they come from deep within the soil. And the frost in that, in, in the soil, brings those things back up to the surface. And sometimes we go through seasons where it brings up things that we thought were gone and things that we thought weren't there, but it starts to bring them back up to the surface. And we're seeing little rocks and and debris, and things like that. And we think everybody can see that. But they can't always. If we're not wise, we, be, we begin to feel discouraged when those things happen. And as a Christian, they are going to happen. So hopefully, it's less than it was before. I mean, I hope you're not getting more rocks every year. So that's that's now that's not good. So <laughs> we're hoping that it's not more. But we can take and we can weed and take the rocks out of the garden in the spring and till the ground. But just life, life brings them more to the surface. And sometimes the birds will drop little things. I get sunflowers sometimes all over my yard, here and there, in the weirdest places. 
because I feed the birds sunflower seeds. And they drop them. I watch the blue jays, and they're trying to get so many in their mouth that they drop them. And so I get them here and there. So sometimes we get a trial or a storm and may come up in our life, like what we're going through the fire. Remember last week we talked about the silversmith? And, um, and you wonder why you're going through a storm, why you're going through a fire, but... You know, the disciples went through storms while Jesus was in the boat. Well, Jesus is in my boat. There's no way I'm going to go through a storm. <laughs> Sorry, you can be on top. And sometimes a storm just happens to start, start to brew. And uh, you can say, well, I'm on top of the world right now. Devil wouldn't, wouldn't bother me. <laughs> but it's not always the devil. But we know that Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for the good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose, right? So in that fire, in that time when we feel those things, the silversmith is, this wasn't in the story, but the dross and the, the impurities start to come to the surface. But without the fire, that's not going to happen. And he skims off the dross. I've watched my wife make stew, and I'm looking at it, and I'm going, I don't want to eat that. But I see her, <laughs> then she skims off the dross, and then I feel a little better. There was one time, though, and uh, this is one of those rocks that, that has cropped back up again, and I might as well <laughs> deal with it right now. I went to the fridge, and I'm not supposed to be drinking out of the bottle. I've been told not to, so... But this is in the middle of the night, and I was thirsty, and there was a soda bottle in there. And I'm thinking, well, we don't even have soda. So I, I, I took a little swig, and it wasn't soda. It was kielbasa fat that she had been saving. <laughs> so well, that was a little bit of a shock. <laughs> Now, I don't know to this day whether she did that on purpose. <laughs> I'm going to believe that she didn't. So, Or I may deal with that in t next week's message. <laughs> but if you ever get a mouthful of kielbasa fat, it doesn't, it's not like eating a piece of kielbasa, trust me. So there are times when it's uncomfortable when he reveals things that are in our heart. And our personality. When his light shines in a shadowed area, an area where we weren't aware of or half suppressed and moved on. God doesn't want those suppressed areas and then have us move on. He may allow it for a while, but sooner or later, God is going to bring that to the surface. That rock is going to come up to the surface because he wants a pure heart. He wants a clean heart. And it's not that we did anything wrong. It's just life sometimes does those things. And so we have those little shadowy areas that God says, well, the closer you get to me, the more I'm going to bring some of those up to the top because I'm going I'm to till your ground. I want to I, I sow in you. It's a good place. I mean, you don't feel it in, at the time. So in... <laughs> In the intestine, we're talking about the body, right? In the intestine, there are little pockets. And sometimes we get food lodges in the pockets in the intestine. And if they're left there, and the body for some reason is not doing the job and cleaning out like it should, we can get diverticulitis. So you can look that up if you can spell it. Diverticulitis, it's brooding on things and not letting go and suppressing offenses and misunderstandings and not letting those leave, not getting rid of them. And uh, they can start to get in the recesses of our spirit. And when they do, they can start to cause infections. And 
they can cause a lot of discomfort. And a lot of times it's a misunderstanding. But they irritate. We don't feel well and we don't know why. But in God's mercies, when we get close enough to God, God starts bringing those things to the surface. And God will get rid of those. But we have to let him work. We have to be, we have to be willing for God to work those deep areas in our life in order to get rid of those things. I'm telling you, it is not a Sunday morning service and a bean supper. We're in, uh, we're in something big. This is big. In these times of God bringing things to the surface, causing the dross to, co dross to come to the top, it is God's love for us, not his dealing with us, that he works in us to cleanse us. Psalm 19, verse 12. David said, who can understand his errors? Meaning his own errors. Who can understand your own errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Cleanse those pockets, God. Cleanse those areas of my heart, God. Those things that are clogging my arteries. Those things that are in my body, Lord, that need to be cleansed and need to be taken out that I don't even know about. They just build up over life and build up over time. And then David said, Psalm 139, 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. I like that song because that song says to you've believed all these other things and you've owned all those. But you need to own your belovedness. You need to own who you are in God and what God wants to do in your life. Thoughts come and go all day. I don't know about you, but I have a busy street. And I have a lot of thoughts. And I've said before, I'm getting a few roundabouts. But I do have, <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts. But they're not all bad. And some thoughts come from things we've seen. Things, you know, I, I, I had a dream the other night, and I, I, it was a cowboy wagon. And I was, <laughs> and I was, I was building a, I was building a raised bed out of my cowboy wagon. And I'm like, where did that come from? That's not God. I'm not going to go. <laughs> and I was, oh wait a minute. I was watching the Rifle Man. <laughs> I was watching the Rifle Man, and then R Ricky had given me some some uh, some garlic. <laughs> so I'm planting the garlic in in in, in the Rifle Man's buckboard. So. So thoughts can come from any place. But when we go to the wrong places, and uh, those are thoughts that will come back when you least want them to, but they will come back, and, uh, and they'll bother us. They stay there. But we can limit those by what we take and in our intake. Okay, I'm going to move on. But when we have these thoughts come to us, they could be thoughts of, of an offense, something somebody said, somebody looked at us crossways, or something with our boss, or anything like that. And we take those and we entertain those thoughts and we start to brood on those. Then they start to take root. And that's where we need to come to God and say, God, I need to get rid of this. And one thing I've learned is that when we come to God, we need to come honestly. You know, he said, if you, if you lack wisdom, he said he won't upbraid you. And, uh, but he encourages us to come to him. But that's the first thing we should do. That's what Adam didn't do. Adam hid. But if Adam had come directly right to God and say, God, I made a mistake. This is what I did. I need help. Maybe things would have been a little different. But at this time when God starts digging in our life, it's not only that he digs up little things that we don't want to be there, and, but sometimes he heals a bruise that we don't know is there. 
Sometimes he speaks to us to reset or prior prioritize, fine-tune, not only from negative things, but to strengthen our own view of ourselves, our worth, our value, our strengths, to refocus our reliance on him. Sometimes he wants us just to reset our sense of dependency. Some things we go through, some things that crop up in our life, it's because God is saying, I see your dependency is starting to wane a little bit. We can get a little cocky. And this is a totally different method of how to deal with it, but my brother had a Samoyed Husky. And his Husky, uh, every once in a while, would want to dominate, and he'd start to take over. And he'd park himself in front of the bathroom. I lived with my brother. And you get up in the middle of the night, and there's the dog. And I'm thinking, this is not working. <laughs> and the dog won't move. And he's obstinate. And then he starts, you know, he starts growling at us, you know, periodically. And, and so what my, <laughs> what my brother used to do is he would grab him by the legs, and he'd do it kind of gently, but he'd roll him down the stairs. And so when that happened, the dog would lay off for a while because he knew that my brother was a little more dominant. He didn't like being rolled down the stairs. So I got a little creative. I wasn't going to roll him down the stairs. He didn't like me. He was afraid of thunder. So I worked in a machine shop, and I got a piece of, <laughs> I got a piece of sheet metal. And I realized that, hey, if I go like this with a sheet metal, <laughs> and so my brother went to work and I stayed home. And every time the dog would start getting obstinate, I'd make thunder just like God. <laughs> I'd make thunder. So when my brother came home, the dog's tail's between his legs, and he goes, what's wrong with the dog? Is he sick? Must be. I don't <laughs> Must be. Maybe he ate something. I don't know. I don't know. You know, I had a really good point when I started that story. <laughs> but I kind of derailed somewhere along the line. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's move on. Psalm 139.3. Thou compassest my path. And we have talked about that in a previous study, that compasses means winnowest. And a winnow, to winnow is to take the fan and do, and you take that, it's, it's, a, it's made out of like a basket, and you pick up the, the, the wheat and you throw it up in the air and the chaff blows away in the wind and the good seed falls back down to the, to the threshing floor. And so God will take the winnow fan in our life, that's what he says. If you read, if you read that, that psalm and you read that area, you'll find that God does that with our life. And it's not a bad thing, but what he's doing is that he is taking the fan and he puts it up in the air. And the chaff, the things that we've had cling to us, the things that we've, we've taken on just by our, our association with the world and things like that, he blows those away so that we're left with just the good seed. And it's God's mercy that he does that. He separates the chaff. He separates the unnecessary, the undesirable or unwanted or counterproductive, and he removes it. It says he examines closely to separate good from the bad. God's mercy working in our life. Do we like the wind sometimes? Not always. But it blows away the chaff that we can't do the undesired things that will cling to us. And we need to understand God's ways toward us. Sometimes his workings with us and motives are totally different than our perception. His ways are much higher than our ways. But we know this, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace, 
not of evil, to bring you to an expected end. We are in God's hands, and we need to trust that. You know, I like that song that they sang about trusting Jesus. And more and more, I'm, I, I'm believing that that is probably 90% of faith, is just trusting him. Just leaving him with him. Trusting him. Trusting that you're in his hands. Trusting that he has your best interest in mind. Trusting that he's taking you in this journey that he's not just wandering you around like my GPS does sometimes, but God has a destination and he's got a goal and he knows exactly where you need to go for your calling and for who you are. You know, remember we talked about the stitchery? And the back of the stitchery was all different ways? Because God has a plan on the other side. He's got a plan for you. So we can misunderstand people but we can also misunderstand God. Now, sometimes God will take us into uh, desert places. So the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. You can look up in Matthew 4. And he was there for 40 days. And sometimes the desert places, we wonder why we're in a dry place. We're wondering why things aren't working the way we think they should. But in those desert places, you know, we all want to have our alabaster box, don't we? And we haven't wanted to have the alabaster box and break that at Jesus' feet. You know, that's a great story, and we, and we read that. But we need to get, gather the spices to put into that box. And we need to understand where those spices come from. The spices were so expensive because they were in the remotest desert places. And the only way to get those was to go into the desert places and to gather them. And so sometimes we go into the desert places in our life and God takes us there. But in our obedience and in our pliability to God and conforming to God in those places... We're gathering, those, we're gathering those spices so that when we do take our alabaster box and break that at Jesus' feet, there's something to that. God, I'm not just breaking a box. When she broke that, that was, that was a symbol of her desires, her dreams, her goals, and she was breaking those at his feet. But when we do that, we can do the same. But God... I remember when I got that spice, when I stood for you in a very, very hard time. And so when we do that, it means something to God. When you put your hands up and worship, he takes your spices and it becomes a sweet-smelling savor to him because he knows those places you've been in for him. In those places you stood for him. In those places you didn't turn around and leave and, and, and come out. But you stayed there and you said, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you. I'm going to go where you lead me to go. And you're gathering those spices as you go. And when he blows the chaff in his winnowing, he not only blows the chaff, but he smells the fragrance of the spices that you've gathered in those desert places. In Song of Solomon 4, 16, again, we're going to read that again. Awake, O north wind, and come, thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Come into my garden, God. Let the, let the wind blow. Let the north wind blow on my life, God. Let the south wind, which is the, that's the gentle wind, but the north wind isn't always so gentle. But God, let that blow so that you can smell the spices that flow out. Not only flow out to you, Lord, but that flow out to the people that I work with. The fragrance. That flow out to my landlord that flow out to my family member. We have Thanksgiving coming up. 
God, let the north wind and the south wind blow. Let my beloved come into his garden. It's your heart. And eat his pleasant fruits. Another thing the wind does is one thing that strengthens like an apple tree. And what it'll do is the wind will come. The winds come. And it blows the, it, it blows the leaves and blows the apples and it strengthens the stem. It needs the winds. Without the winds, the apples will fall prematurely and rot on the ground. They need the wind. God knows what he's doing with us. We need to trust him. He knows what he's doing with the fruit trees and the natural. He knows what he's doing with you. Well, I've got this wind coming, God, and it's just, it seems like it's just blowing. You don't see what's going on when you're in his hands and what God is doing with your life while that's happening. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? This isn't working out right, isn't it? Give it time. Give it time. So not only the chaff, but the spices of our life are gathered for him so that he'll walk in our garden and we fill our alabaster box to break at his feet. Our dreams, our ambitions, our goals are laid at his feet. Maybe we're not in a place where we want to lay all those at his feet yet. Maybe we're getting there. Maybe we're just gathering them in our alabaster box, but there's going to come a time. In your garden, everybody has a Gethsemane. When you're going to take that box, your dreams, your goals, your visions for yourself, and you're going to lay them at his feet, in the garden, and you're going to drink the cup that he drank from and said, God, I'm laying it down. I'm coming to the place, God, where I'm laying it down. Maybe some of us are getting there. Maybe some of us are there. Maybe some are in the garden right now. It's a place where we all have to go. He was led to the wilderness. But the garden, he went by choice. He went to the garden. He said, we're going to the garden. His disciples, he said, you're sleeping now. But he's thinking there's a time coming when you're going to be here and you're not going to be sleeping. But I'll be there with you because I've been there. These winds also come, in, come to blow upon the stems of the fruit and strengthen the fruit. Let my beloved come into his garden. A weeded garden. A healthy garden. And a fruitful garden. Having allowed the master gardener to weed, till, and winnow. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. John 3 3. First John 3 3. Purifieth himself through his compliance to the Holy Spirit, yielding to his will and his workings, molding and his plan for our life, his working in us toward our calling making us a vessel fit for the master's use, for the body to edify so that we can be his hands, his mouthpiece, his flow-through, and his representative. When we give our lives to him, we willingly became his. Join heirs. Romans eight seventeen says if and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Suffering in the compliance, suffering in the laying down of our life. You know, it's one thing to talk about these things and think that they're so far off and, and it's the big picture, but sometimes it's in the little things. It's in the little things of our attitude at work. Do we comply when it's hard to comply? Do we comply 
with situations that are contrary. But God, I have two things in my arsenal. I have a sword and I have a towel. Which one am I going to choose? Am I going to choose the sword and cut off his ear? Or am I going to take the towel and walk away with spices for my box? Individual times, individual days, individual weeks and months, our compliances, our, our willingness to be in God's hands, in God's wheel, in the fire. And sometimes situations come and people are contrary and some situations can really try us to the core. Sometimes life happens. We lose a loved one. And I've really been really concerned, not concerned, but burdened for the people who have lost loved ones in here. People have lost a son or lost a husband or, you know, we can forget about them and say, oh, the funeral's over, but it's, things aren't over for them. So as the body of Christ, we need to think about those things. We need to get in the place where God can speak to us. God can wake us in the night. That's part of compliance. Well, God woke me up. Am I going to get up or am I going to lay there? Am I going to slumber? Take off my shoes. Take off my coat. When I know that he's in the field and he's knocking at the door with his locks wet with the dew from the harvest and go back to sleep. Sometimes we need to get up. In our purifying ourselves, it's not something we can always do ourselves. And John Bosco shared a little thing on me about a palm tree. And a palm tree, when it's time for the new growth in the tree, the old leaves, you don't need to pick them off. The sap in the, in the life that's in the tree wants to push out with new life so much that it pushes the old dead thing off. When we become so filled with Christ and so filled with the sap from the rootstock and the vine, it'll push these other things off, out. It'll, those things will fall off. When we first got saved, a lot of us, a lot of these things that, that, that were hindering us just fell off, didn't they? They were just gone. Where'd they go? It's because we had so much of Christ on the inside that it couldn't stand it. You know, lightning, when it hits a tree and the tree explodes, it's not the lightning that actually explodes the tree. It boils the sap inside the tree and the tree implodes because it can't handle the, the, the heat of the sap the power of the sap that's inside. And the flesh of the tree implodes and just blows apart. When your sap, your Holy Ghost gets so strong in you, that outer man is just going to, parts are just going to blow off. Because of the power that's inside. 2 Corinthians 5.4 for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, not that we have to work and get all these things out of our life because we can't do it all ourselves, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. The mortality that's in us is swallowed up by the life of Christ, by the Holy Ghost that's in us. Let the Holy Ghost do his work in you. Draw closer. Cleave to him. Cling to the vine. But when you're clinging to the vine, be careful of the little foxes that will nip at your vine and take that sap away. Now, a branch that doesn't have the proper flow becomes brittle. And it snaps. It's no longer pliable. It's not pliable in your hands. We don't become pliable in God's hands. We become brittle, easily offended, because we're not allowing the sap. Check 
for foxes and see if there's something nipping at your vine and there's something leaking out of your vine. And when this happens, always good to check, double check, and triple check. It's him in us and through us. He's our treasure, isn't he? 2 Corinthians 4, 7, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. It's God that worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Christ in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Is he just doing anything with the church right now? No. It's not just anything. God is preparing us. He's preparing individuals. He's preparing us as a body. And he's putting us together. Assembling ourselves together. Peace upon peace upon peace upon peace. Assembling. Click, click, click. The laying down of our life for each other. Loving one another, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. More than just a Sunday morning. God wants to use you. God wants to use me. It's God's desire to give you the kingdom. God wants to use you. More than you want to be used. He needs to be able to speak to us, to call us, to use us, to keep the channel open. Awake, O north wind, and come thou south upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. We don't have a lot longer left. It's what God thinks of us. It's what God is trying to mold us into. Does God look and see all your faults and your failures and your shortcomings? In it? No. No, he doesn't. He says, you're mine. I smiled when I made you. I find you beautiful in every way. My love for you is fierce and unending. I'll come to find you whatever it takes. I'm time to own your belovedness. It's time to realize who we are. Time to realize who your brother is. Time to realize who your sister is. Is it just your sister? Is it just your brother? No, it's not. It's not. We're all joint heirs. We're all the beloved of Christ. And we all stand. If God could get through to us, there's a story that someone told before about this man who had a lot of birds that were around his farm. And a bad storm was coming. And so he's looking at the birds and he had compassion on them. And he opened up the garage door, or the, the barn door, and he's, he's trying to shoo the birds into the barn for safety because, I don't know if it was a cyclone or whatever it was, but it was a bad storm. And he's trying to get the birds in, but the birds just didn't get it. They were afraid of him. They were afraid of, of him coming near them. And so he's saying, well, if you don't go in, you're going to perish out here. And he, he couldn't get through to them. And he said to himself, if only I could get through to them what I'm trying to do. But Christ was that, was like that with man. If only I could get through to them, how am I going to do that? I know, I'll become one of them so that I can show my love and show what I'm trying to do and my plan for them and make them understand what I'm trying to do with their lives. And he became one of us.
If there's someone here and you don't know Christ, you, you haven't had a real personal relationship with him, you've heard about him, but you haven't really experienced him really in your life as our ushers come, they can pray with you and you can leave with everything we talked about. The love of God is also toward you. It's not just everybody in here. We all came the same way. We all came the same way. If not, when we gather around, this altar is a place of consecration. And it's a place of saying, God, I'm willing to be molded. I'm willing to comply. God, mold me and make me into what you want me to be, God. And he wants to use us. He wants to use us. Can 
Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Oh, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Use me, use me. If you can use anything. in this day, God, as we go about our days and our weeks and our months this year, as Thanksgiving and Christmas comes, God, use us in this season to touch a life, to save a soul, to cause healing to come, God, to somebody's body. God, use us in this day, I pray. God, touch everybody on social media right now, God. Visit them in their homes, Lord. If they're sick, heal them. God, if they need deliverance, deliver them. God, if they're believing for a miracle, God, we ask in this place that you will grant it in your name, God. Use your people in this day, we pray. Hallelujah, Jesus, we thank you, God. You are a mighty Father, Lord. We thank you for everything that you've done this year, for everything you're going to do, God. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, you're a good Good Father, honorable Shatai, Jesus, we thank you. Oh God, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you, God. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you, Jesus. I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for your hand in my life. I thank you, God, for your hand in your people, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God Almighty. Honorable Shatai still praying please feel free to keep praying hallelujah there's no way we can end this but if you can stay clean please help us to clean god bless you as you go about your week thank you social media bless you we are with you we're praying for you thank you for joining tonight hallelujah <laughs>